privacy protection in, digital, in the digital environment. The challenge for Canada is that the EU, which is a market of over half a billion consumers, well-heeled consumers, the EU measures its willingness to mutually allow sharing of information with other countries against that GDPR, that standard that they've set. And those who fall short of the rigor of that privacy regime will find it difficult to con conduct business with the EU. So does our current regime measure up? And does this legislation measure up to the GDPR from the EU? Probably not. In fact, for years, Canada's digital data privacy framework has been lagging behind our international counterparts. And the problem is that if we don't meet the standard, we'll not be able to do the kind of business with the EU that we expect to. Now, I wanted to say this, Mr. Speaker. As someone who played a part in negotiating our free trade agreement with the European Union, it would be an absolute travesty to see that work go to waste because our country wasn't willing to adopt robust privacy and data protections. It would be a travesty. Now, I note that, as is the custom with our Liberal friends, the bill creates more costs for taxpayers to bear. There's a creation of new responsibilities and powers for the Commissioner, which we support. But I also note that this legislation calls for the creation of this separate tribunal, a new layer of bureaucracy, red tape, that small and medium-sized enterprises are going to have to grapple with. Now, there are other unanswered questions, Mr. Speaker. Why doesn't this legislation formally recognize privacy as a fundamental right? Regrettably, as presented, Bill C-27 misses the opportunity to produce a path-breaking statute that addresses the enormous risks and asymmetries by, that are posed by today's surveillance business model. Our key trading partners, especially the EU, have set the bar very high, and the adequacy of our own privacy legislation could very well be rescinded by the EU under its privacy regime. Mr. Speaker, 35 years ago, our Supreme Court affirmed that privacy is at the heart of liber liberty in a modern state. Yet nowhere in this bill is that right formally recognized. Any 21st century privacy regime should recognize privacy as a fundamental human right that is inextricably linked to other fundamental rights and freedoms. By the way, Mr. Speaker, I do share the belief that as a fundamental right, it's not appropriate to balance off this right to privacy against the rights of corporations and commercial interests. Personal privacy must remain sacrosanct. When measured against that standard, this Bill 27 fails miserably. Now, Mr. Speaker, I've got much more to say, but I'll wind up by saying this. This bill is another missed opportunity to get Canada's privacy legislation right by consulting widely and learning from best practices from around the world. There's a lot riding on this bill, including the willingness of some of our largest trading partners to allow reciprocal data flows. This bill is not consistent with contemporary global standards. Now, the Center for Digital Rights notes that this le legislation, quote, fails to address the reality that dominant data-driven enterprises have shifted away from a service-oriented business to a model that relies on monetizing personal information through the mass surveillance of individuals and groups. End quote. That should be a wake-up call to all of us, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, this bill fails to listen to that call. Let me repeat, there's a move towards monetizing personal information through mass surveillance of individuals and groups. And this government has not yet recognized that. So for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I expect we, 
as Conservatives will be opposing this bill and voting against it. Thank you very much. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, questions and commentaries? Uh, the Honourable Member for Abitibi, Ms. Kamang. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thought CHAP GTP also did test on that and being, but I asked with respect to what my from Abers colleague from Abbotsford said, what were the consequences of not legislating on C-27? And the answer was interesting because what he said was that it could have an impact on data protection from cor corporations. So if we don't take action now, will mean that we will lose more data if we don't provide a framework with all the games they're doing in the House right now, making us lose time, etc., can Conservatives realize that if we don't adopt C-27, they'll be creating risk for the privacy of Quebecers and Canadians? Not at all, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, we're certainly not trivializing Bill C-27. In fact, right now, it's only the Conservative members of Parliament who are even speaking to this, speaking to the most important issue of privacy and protecting privacy of Canadians within an emerging digital environment. I, I'm actually disappointed that my colleague in this House from the Bloc doesn't take this issue seriously enough to get up in this House and actually debate it. It's important that we get this right. What we have is a redux of the old bill that the Liberals brought forward. It was so roundly castigated and panned at committee that the minister had to go back to the drawing boards. He comes back with essentially the same milk toast uh, legislation that actually doesn't address the most critical parts of protecting pr the privacy of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay. Thank you. I have great respect for my colleague and I have great interest in his speech and the issue of putting privacy as a fundamental human right. One of the shocking things we found with the last bill was when the Privacy Commissioner ruled that the company Clearview AI had broken Canadian law by allowing all manner of photographs of Canadian families, Canadian individuals, Canadian children to be sold on a market and a facial recognition technology. Our Privacy Commissioner called that out as illegal, but he told us, the Commissioner told us, that under the new law, it would be almost impossible for him to go after Clearview AI because his rulings could be overturned by a board that the Liberals will point above him. We trust our privacy, Commissioner. We need to protect privacy. I want to ask my honourable colleague why he thinks the Liberals are undermining privacy at this time. The honourable member for Abbotsford. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have mutual respect for that member. We're both class of 2006, I believe. 2004. 2004. Okay, he's, he's got a couple of years on me. But, Mr. Speaker, I agree with him 100 percent. What's happened here is that this government, in order to protect its right to interfere in protecting the rights, privacy rights of Canadians, has established this tribunal that could overwrite override the commissioner's investigations of violations of privacy rights within Canada. And he mentioned the Clearview AI situation. He's absolutely right. That was a fundamental breach of our privacy rights. But you know, there are Canadian companies like Tim Hortons that have also violated Canadians' privacy rights. That's why it's important we get this right now, not put through a milk toast bill that won't actually achieve what we want it to do and allows this Liberal government to continue to interfere and protect its big business buddies. I just mentioned the importance of making sure our privacy rights are protected in an era when data is being monetized. Canadians' own personal information is being monetized by corporate interests. We need to make sure that our rights are protected. This bill does not go far enough. In comments, question come out there. The honourable member for South Shore St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, the honourable member a question about Section 5 of the bill. Section 5 is the purpose section. It's probably the most important section of any bill. The purpose section, which sets out 
the reason why this legislation is in. And that's a section where the government says an individual's rights are equal to that of a business right to use your personal information. So that's the section, in my view, that needs to be amended to protect personal rights, uh, personal privacy rights as a fundamental right. I wonder if the member could comment about why that's so important in that section of the bill to have fundamental right put in that spot. Member for Abbotsford. Thank the member for the question. Excellent question, because that is the fundamental failing of this Bill C-27. We have an opportunity once and for all to express and to codify the right that Canadians have to have their personal information data protected. And typically, that kind of a statement of purpose goes into that purpose section. It is completely missing from that section because we know the Liberals really are unserious when it comes to protecting Canadians' privacy rights. Mr. Speaker, we can do better than this. We have time for a quick uh, last one. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this legislation is all about protecting the, the rights and privacy of Canadians. What I'm um, surprised is this member, more so than any other Conservative member, has been very clear. The Conservative Party of Canada opposes this legislation. Am I then to, to believe that the Conservative Party will in fact be voting no against the legislation going to committee? The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, Mr. Speaker, as that member should know, the process, the parliamentary process, calls for bills that come forward to this chamber to have the opportunity to be considered at committee, where you then call in witnesses, you call in stakeholders from across the country to express their views on this legislation. And it's within that context that I've expressed serious reservations about the legislation as it is currently drafted. Now, I expect we will allow this to go to committee and hopefully this Liberal government does what it so rarely does, listens to the stakeholders, listens to the witnesses, and then makes the fundamental changes to this legislation that I have referenced, which could make this a salvageable bill and allow us to vote in favour of it. Statements by members. Déclaration de député, the Honourable Member for Scarborough Centre. Mr. Speaker. Scarborough is home to Grey Cup champion. On Sunday at Scarborough Town Centre, Toronto Argonauts running back Daniel Adebovai brought the Grey Cup home to Scarborough, signing autographs and posing for pictures with fans. As part of the 2022 Grey Cup champion Argos, Daniel was a nominee for the league's most outstanding special teams player and is an inspiration to our local youth. He took the time to speak with all of the kids and encourage them to reach for their dreams. Daniel grew up in Scarborough, and also on hand were his proud parents, Pastor Chai and Marianne Adebobor of Wilmer Heights Baptist Church. Mr. Speaker, Daniel Adebobor reminds Scarborough youth that with hard work and determination, all is possible. Thank you, Daniel, for bringing the Grey Cup home, and let's go Argo! The Honourable Member for Bay of Quinty. Mr. Speaker, as members of Parliament, we stand in the House of Commons for the good of the common people, their paychecks, their savings, their homes and their country. But Mr. Speaker, in order to work for the common people, you must have common sense. With 40-year high inflation, families are having to make common sense decisions each and every day about their budgets and expect the government to do the same by getting by with what they already have. Rain in spending, no new taxes, and improve the services that Canadians are already paying for. Families are having to choose those decisions each and every day, from grocery items, having to choose where sports, or the children are spending sports, and, where, and, and canceling family vacation plans. But the Prime Minister is displaying none of the common sense that Canadians are. $6,000 hotel rooms, $162,000 Jamaican vacation plans, while Canadians are cutting back and expect that common sense from the government. Mr. Speaker, we need a new Prime Minister who displays real leadership, real common sense, and looks after the common people. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Halifax. The Honourable Member for Halifax. 
Mr. Speaker, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, an attack on the international rules-based order the Canadians fought and died to build, has underscored the importance of multilateral alliances such as NATO. It has also highlighted the urgent need for NATO allies to advance innovative defense and peacekeeping systems to protect the alliance against hostile actors. It's in this evolving security environment that NATO is establishing a network of innovation sites in North America and Europe. And after a Team Atlantic effort, the Minister of National Defense announced earlier this year that it will submit Halifax as the host city for the Defense Innovation Accelerator of the North Atlantic, or DIANA. Mr. Speaker, there is no better choice. Halifax, with our thriving ecosystem of entrepreneurial science and technology startups, universities and research centers, and Canada's Atlantic Naval Fleet, uh, fleet is the right place for Diana. This is a major deal for the Halifax region. Once ratified by NATO, it means investment in jobs, growing our innovation and tech sectors, all while supporting the NATO alliance. Thank you to everyone who was a part of the campaign to make this happen. The Honourable Member for Rivière de Melilla. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I would like to highlight the anniversary of an organization that has been serving Rivière de Melilla for 50 years, and I that is the Centre d'Antaire de Racine Lavoie. The centre encourages the autonomy and development of low income individuals and families by offering a wide range of services and activities. Year after year, the Centre Racine Lavoie offers a tax clinic for people who cannot afford professional services a collective kitchen to promote healthy eating, a lunchbox workshop. It's for affordable optician services, conferences on a variety of subjects, and so much more. The Centre Racine Lavoie is a tightly knit family where the values of sharing, mutual aid, and solidarity prevail. Congratulations to the Centre de Racine Lavoie team for this jubilee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good budget day to all. The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellon. Mr. Speaker, I would like to highlight the performance of our Laval athletes at the 56 Quebec Games held from the 3rd to the 11th of March in Rivière du Loup. They won eight gold, six silver, and 11 bronze medals. You make us all proud. But it is the performance of young Liam Schmidt from Alfred Pellan that deserves special attention. At only 14 years of age, Liam gave us an extraordinary performance breaking the Quebec Games record in novice figure skating with a score of 92.2. He said, I'm surprised to have broken the record. I'm very proud and I'm going to keep working hard. In addition to being an outstanding athlete, he shows us that our Quebec youth is full of talent, determination and hope. Congratulations, Liam, for your incredible performance and keep doing what makes you happy. The Honourable Member for Red Deer Lacombe. Mr. Speaker, today I would like to acknowledge a significant accomplishment by a Canadian angler that has made our nation proud. Jeff Gustafson of Kenora has made history by becoming the first Canadian to win the Bass Master Classic, a prestigious tournament in the sport of professional bass fishing. With a 5 pound, 12 ounce lead going into the final round over American John Cox, Gustafson managed to boat just two fish that weighed a combined 6 pounds, 13 ounces to edge his opponent and win. And what a spectacle it was, Mr. Speaker. Gustafson's win is a testament to the hard work and dedication of Canadian anglers who continue to showcase their skills on the world stage. Conservatives know that fishing is more than just a hobby for many Canadians. It's a way of life. We take pride in our Canadian heritage and we celebrate Gustafson's win with him. May his achievement inspire generations of Canadians to continue to celebrate our heritage and the great outdoors through the sport of fishing. Way to go, Gussie. The Honourable Member for Surrey Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. March is National Engineering Month. As a fellow engineer, I want to acknowledge the individual work that engineers do in my riding of Surrey Newton and, of course, in my colleague and dear friend, Minister of Transport and a fellow engineer's riding of Mississauga Centre and communities throughout Canada. Presented by Engineers Canada, the annual campaign is designed to spark an interest in youth and the next generation of engineering professionals while celebrating the role that engineers play in our daily lives. The theme for this year's National Engineering Month 
is there is a place for you in engineering mm. which highlights the inclusive nature of the profession and showcases its diversity in perspectives, opportunities, and people. To all those considering joining the profession, I can proudly say there is a place for you in engineering. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Parkdale High Park. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday, a 16-year-old was stabbed to death at Kiel subway station in my riding of Parkdale High Park. Gabriel Magaloish was simply sitting on a bench, minding his own business, when a complete stranger, unprovoked, randomly attacked him, stabbing him three times. On December 8th, two women were stabbed at High Park subway station, also in my constituency. Vanessa Kropieska was killed that day. Again, the violence was unprovoked, the attacker and the victims unknown to each other. Over 12 months, there have been four homicides and countless assaults. Passengers have been attacked with weapons, pushed onto subway tracks, and a woman was set ablaze. The senseless, random violence must stop. Torontonians cannot be frightened about taking transit. Immediately, we need an increased presence of uniformed staff and TTC officials to reassure passengers of their safety. Going forward, every level of government must commit funding to support mental health and improved housing in our city. Confidence in the TTC must be restored. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Barrie Innisfil. Mr. Speaker, April is Parkinson's Awareness Month in Canada, and I want to recognize the residents of Barrie Innisfil and my friend Greg McGuinness for using his voice to bring awareness to Parkinson's disease for the 100,000 Canadians who are living with Parkinson's. In 2023, 35 Canadians a day will be diagnosed with Parkinson's. It's the fastest growing neurological disease in the world. Widely considered a disease of older Canadians, young onset Parkinson's is afflicting 20% of diagnosed Canadians under the age of 50. There's presently no cure for Parkinson's, but researchers continue to search and hope that one will be discovered. A greater awareness about Parkinson's is needed in an effort to work together so every Canadian who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's can enjoy a good quality of life. There's this greater awareness is what my friend Greg has asked me to do by bringing this message to the House of Commons today. I'd also like to thank Parkinson's Canada for their commitment to transform the lives of people living with Parkinson's. Here. The Honourable Member for Beaches, East York. Mr. Speaker, Jessica Rotolo is an actor, artist, dancer, model and role model, Beaches, East York constituent, Humber grad and a big Jays fan. She's also a relentless advocate for her Down syndrome community. In addition to her award-winning PSAs and countless media appearances, Jessica is the winner of Down Syndrome International's Lots of Socks competition. Her heart design was chosen among hundreds of submissions and can be found on over 17,000 pairs of socks sold for World Down Syndrome Day last week. I was lucky to spend that day with Jessica, other Down Syndrome advocates, and a loving community at her old school, Hayden Park. Everyone there understood the core idea of inclusion. No matter our differences, we all deserve equal treatment and opportunity to participate. And it isn't a matter of working for the Down syndrome community, but with them. On behalf of everyone in this house, thank you, Jessica, for what you've done and continue to do. We can't wait to see all that you accomplish. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Charlesbourg, Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, I'm saddened today to learn the death of Sergeant Maureen Bro last night whilst making an arrest. In Louis V, like Sergeant Bro had over 20 years of experience with the Sortie du Québec, it is true that every time officers lose their lives in the line of duty, it is a painful reminder of the constant danger they face every day they wear their badge. We do not put our lives at risk when we go to work in the morning, but police officers do. It is a reality that they face every day. It is a reality that their spouses, children and families face on a daily basis. Oh, for Sergeant Bro's family, my condolences. I want them to know that we all feel a sense of helplessness when evil strikes, but that evil cannot stop us from celebrating the importance of Sergeant Bro to public safety and what she meant to her friends and so many others. Being a police officer is not a job, it is a calling. By accepting this calling, Sergeant Bro demonstrated her selflessness for the citizens she served. Rest in peace, Maureen. The Honourable Member for Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. After eight 
years of this Prime Minister, everything feels broken and Canadians are struggling. In Canada, it's understood. If you follow the rules, work hard and contribute to your community, you will be able to make a good living, buy a home and raise your family in a safe neighbourhood. And the government ensures the right conditions exist to make this possible. After eight years of this Prime Minister, the contract is broken. While the Liberals continue with their high spending, inflation has hit 40-year highs, destroying Canadian savings. Canadians are losing their homes, and hundreds of thousands more are using food banks. They're hurting, and this Liberal government refuses to take responsibility. The Finance Minister has promised to show fiscal restraint in today's budget, but we've heard these promises before. Canadians need a government that will be fiscally responsible and remember its contract with its citizens. If this government won't, they need to step aside so Conservatives can. Hey, hey. The Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, last week was a difficult one in Halifax West as our community dealt with the stabbing of two staff members at Charles P. Allen High School. Thankfully, both Ms. Light and Mr. Rogers have now been released from hospital. We wish them well in their recovery, and I will be keeping them in my prayers. I'd like to extend my gratitude to the staff, students, first responders, and community members who helped during and after this horrific event, especially grade 10 students Rory Shadwick and Easton Schlender, who assisted Mr. Rogers as they waited for paramedics to arrive. CPA's principal, Stephanie Bird, has done an incredible job supporting her staff and students as they begin the healing process, and I thank her for that. Mr. Speaker, we are wounded but are filled with hope as our community is there to support one another in this difficult time. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Skeena Boakley Valley. Mr. Speaker, there are few things more devastating for a small rural community than learning that its main employer is closing its doors. That's the news that the people of Houston, B.C. received last month when Canfor announced it's closing its sawmill in that community. 300 mill employees are going to lose their jobs. That's 10 percent of the community's population and hundreds more who work for local contractors and other businesses. Mayor Shane Breenan sees a path forward for his community, but he's called on this federal government to help. I spoke with Scott Rizell from the forestry consulting company ProTech, and he talked about the need for a program like the Job Opportunity Program from 2009 to help displace forestry workers. The steel workers have called for reinstatement of EI flexibility that was put in place during the pandemic, and yet this government has done nothing. The B.C. government is there in Houston, on the ground, working with the community, coming up with a plan. I implore the federal government to be there for the community during this difficult time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Avignon and Métis, Matan Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, for our police officers, the price of public safety is to put every day their safe return home on the line. Last night in Louisville, police officer Sergeant Marine Bro lost her life in the line of duty during an arrest. Sergeant Bro had been a police officer with the Sûreté du Québec since 2002. She had more than 20 years of experience in police patrol and had been a relief supervisor since 2019. Mr. Speaker, this tragedy is a reminder that there is no such thing as a routine interventions for our police forces, that each one is critical, even for experienced officers. Let us never forget the importance of the work done by our police officers and the respect they deserve. On behalf of the Bloc Québécois, I would like to offer my most sincere condolences to Ms. Bro's family and friends. We also offer our solidarity to the entire team of the Mesquinanger RCM station. Finally, we wish a speedy recovery to Ms. Bro's colleague, who was also injured during this intervention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lee. 
truth about Beijing's interference in our democracy and to know what the Prime Minister is hiding and why he refused to act in defense of Canada. The Globe and Mail reported that Beijing, quote, employed a sophisticated strategy to disrupt Canada's democracy in the 2021 federal election campaign and that, quote, their proxies backed the re-election of the member for Papineau's Liberals, end quote. For weeks, the Liberals blocked the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff from testifying and it was only under the pressure of Conservatives and an outcry from the public that the Liberal obstruction collapsed. It's no wonder these Liberals are blocking the truth. The Prime Minister has benefited from dictator dollars through the Trudeau Foundation and a sweetheart book deal pushed by the communist regime's propagandists. The Liberals plan to have a secret committee with secret evidence, secret hearings and a secret conclusion is just not acceptable. A fully independent public inquiry is the only way to credibly investigate Beijing's interference in our democracy and to uncover what and when the Liberals knew about this foreign interference in our democracy. The Honourable Member for Kitchener South Hespler. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express my appreciation for the brave men and women who serve as firefighters all across Canada. Their dedication to keeping our communities safe from the dangers of fire and other emergencies is truly admirable. This week, firefighters from Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo and across Canada are descending on Ottawa to advocate for legislation to better protect those who so selflessly protect us. They are bringing to light the risks posed by PFASs used in firefighting protective gear and regulatory shortfalls that have resulted in firefighters at several major airports not being well positioned to respond quickly to aviation emergencies. It is our responsibility as legislators to ensure the safety of our firefighters and the public they serve. We must work collaboratively to find alternate to solutions to PFAS laden gear and address the regulatory gaps to ensure the safety of those who travel through our airports. I want to express my deepest appreciation to all firefighters for their service, dedication and sacrifices. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Great statement. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The former Minister of Finance under the Liberal government, Bill Morneau, the future Liberal leader, Mark Carney, Tiff Macklem, the current Governor of the Bank of Canada, And now, the current finance minister has admitted that deficits lead to inflation. The minister of finance said in the last budget, we are fully determined to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. We must continue to reduce that ratio. This is a line that we will not cross. Will the prime minister step over that line today? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, I know that members across the way are on tenterhooks to see the budget, but I can reassure them that our priority is to help Canadians. We will be there to help them with the cost of living, with targeted measures to help. We will be there to deliver health care, more money for the provinces, to ensure that there is access to dental care, although the Conservatives voted against that. And we will also be there to create middle-class jobs in a green, growing economy. Those are our government's priorities. The last three days in Canada, Saturday night, a 16-year-old boy stabbed to death at a Toronto subway in an unprovoked attack by a repeat offender. Sunday evening, a father stabbed to death outside of Vancouver Starbucks with his wife and daughter present. Sunday night, a man stabbed on a Toronto City bus and taken to hospital. Monday night, uh, a sub sergeant, a police officer, killed in near La Trois Rivières, and in the early morning uh, of this day, a young girl shot to death in Calgary. This is part of the 32 percent increase in violent crime since the Prime Minister took office. Will he reverse the policies that caused that? The right honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, we are, like all Canadians, deeply concerned with some of the very uh, heinous crimes that we've seen over the past uh, number of days, the increase uh, in violent attacks on innocent Canadians uh, and on those serving the public through law enforcement uh, is extremely concerning. That's why we will continue to be there to make investments in public safety. Uh, unlike Conservatives who cut funding for police officers, we've invested uh, in public safety. We invested in municipal police officers as we've invested in community safety programs, as we strengthened gun control, as we've continued uh, to strengthen uh, consequences uh, for violent offenders. Uh, we will continue to be there to keep Canadians safe. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. People are tired of hearing about his concern. They want to know what he's going to do to reverse the damage he's caused. He brought in a bail system that allows repeat violent offenders back out on the street again and again, sometimes released the very same day in Vancouver. The same 40 violent offenders were arrested 6,000 times in a year. That's 150 arrests per criminal per year as a result, a direct result, of the Prime Minister's uh, easy bail system. Will he replace bail with jail for repeat violent yeah. offenders? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, uh, we will continue to work on bail reform, including uh, working with the provinces to ensure that we have a fair and responsible system that keeps Canadians safe right across the country. But if the member opposite was really serious about moving forward on keeping communities safe, he'd back our upcoming Bill 21 at third reading to make sure that we're keeping uh, assault weapons out of the hands uh, of people across this country, that we're strengthening gun control uh, to freeze handguns, that we're continuing to move forward instead of being in the pockets of the NRA to focus on Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Unbelievable. He thinks that a hunter in Nunavut is responsible for the stabbings in downtown Vancouver. How ridiculous. We, under his policy of targeting law-abiding citizens while we're allowing repeat violent offenders to go out on the street again and again, we've seen a 32% increase in violent offences. In, in fact, one of the detectives close to the case in Toronto said that the offender was out again on numerous releases. Probation, prohib pro prohibited bail, you name it, he's been released on it. This is a full-scale justice system failure. Will he reverse it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, amidst all this tragedy, it's interesting to see the lengths to which the Conservative leader will go to avoid talking about his desire to weaken gun control in this country, to bring assault weapons back into the communities where they were banned over the past couple of years by this government. We've put a freeze on handguns uh, in the market across the country. Uh, we're strengthening gun control, and every step of the way, the Conservative Party stands against it, Mr. Speaker. And that's why I'm asking them, uh, with their concerns about public safety right now, Will they step up and accelerate the passage of C-21 when it comes back to this House for, 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 for third reading? Leader of the Opposition. When we were in office in the last year, there was 124,000 fewer violent crimes than there was last year. Violent crime, including murders, have skyrocketed under this policy of this Prime Minister. He's targeting law-abiding hunters and farmers rather than the, vi the repeat violent offenders who are committing the crime. Why won't he look at the evidence which has demonstrated that our streets are, have now turned into war zones after eight years of his policy, and will he replace bail with jail for repeat violent offenders? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite himself brought up what they did under the Harper government uh, in those years. What they did was loosen gun control laws. What they did was make it easier uh, for people to buy assault-style weapons, and that led to direct increases in gun ownership and, unfortunately, in violent crime across the country. That's why we're trying to bring back uh, stronger gun control legislation. Despite the Conservatives' ideological opposition to gun control, we will continue to put the safe of Canadians and their communities first. We will continue with stronger gun control laws right across the country. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Chinese interference. 
The media have alleged that a Liberal MP advised the Chinese diplomat to delay, the, to delay freeing Canadians held in China. On Friday, the Globe and Mail revealed that the Prime Minister was informed of that conversation in 2021, but he decided that it wasn't serious enough to take action. But it was serious enough for that Liberal member to leave the caucus, serious enough that several sources leaked the information, and serious enough that the media published it. Are they all wrong, or is it once again the Prime Minister showing a lack of judgment? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague should be careful with the facts that he presents in this House and check them, because we wouldn't want to mislead this House. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that we have always taken these allegations seriously. We have always ensured that actions are taken when necessary, and we will continue to do so without playing partisan games. We will focus on experts and authorities that can do the work and keep Canadians safe, and not instead try to score political points as the Conservatives and the Bloc Québécois are doing. The Honourable Member. Well, the Prime Minister should pay some attention to his credibility, because that's the key here. Every time the intelligence services tell the Prime Minister something about Chinese interference since 2019 has gone in one ear and out the other, I don't know whether he's complacent or just naive. He does not have the credibility to lead the inquiry or to choose the commissioner or a rapporteur, and he does not have the credibility to give that person a mandate. In fact, the only thing that would be credible would be to launch a public, independent public inquiry. When will he finally wake up? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we can really see that the Bloc Québécois is trying to, do, trying to do anything it can to score political points. If they really cared about the credibility of anyone in this House, well, they could count on an independent expert like the former Governor General, who will be the one to decide if we need a public inquiry, what kind of inquiry what the necessary resources are that we should use to support the inquiry or to reassure Canadians. And that's exactly, it's exactly because of the partisanship we see here that we are going to count on independent public expertise. That's what we need. For Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, Ukrainians fleeing from Russia's brutal, illegal war are looking to start over and build a new life in Canada. But the Liberals' emergency travel measures have a three-year limit meaning that Ukrainians can't participate in most trade apprenticeships. Ukrainians are effectively being shut out of the trades because of this limit. It's wrong, and union leaders like Scott Crichton from IBEW 424 want this to change. Will the Liberal government remove the limit so that Ukrainians can train and work in Canada. Mm -hmm. Here, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to sit down with union leaders, including at the IBEW across the country, and I've had an opportunity to thank them directly for all the incredible leadership they are showing in training up uh, Ukrainians and other new arrivals in this country uh, to be able to contribute fully to this country that is uh, offering so much and uh, going to benefit so much from them being here. We will continue uh, to work hand in hand uh, with you union leadership and union members right across the country on creating growth for the middle class, on creating a strong future for our communities, and yes, on helping people fleeing war and violence all around the world. Uh, on that, this government is close friends with unions and will continue to be. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, with the cost of food and housing soaring, Canadian seniors are being left behind. In my riding of Nanaimo, Lady Smith, seniors tell me they can't make ends meet. To make matters worse, for seniors who are disproportionately women, widowed or singled, costs are even harder to keep up with. Yet, they pay more in taxes than their coupled counterparts. Will the Prime Minister end these discriminatory tax rules, implement equitable tax benefits, and finally start supporting seniors? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, one of the very first things we did uh, was significantly increase the GIS uh, for the most vulnerable single seniors because we knew that that was something we needed. Unfortunately, the NDP actually voted against that measure, but we continued over the past years by doubling the GST tax credit and putting more money back in the pockets of seniors, by providing nearly two million low-income renters with financial relief, including seniors. We're per we permanently increased the OAS for seniors aged 
75 and up, and we restored the age of eligibility for OAS back to 65 from the 67 that Conservatives raised it to. On this side of the House, we will continue to be there for seniors, whether it's through COVID, whether it's through housing affordability, we'll be there. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. A moment ago, I listed four stabbing deaths that have happened in the last three days, including a police officer. And the Prime Minister glibly got up and said, well, he's going to ban hunting rifles. <laughs> yeah. Stabbings happen with knives, <laughs> not hunting rifles. Perhaps that's why we see a 32 percent increase in violent crime since this Prime Minister took office. He's not looking at logic or facts. It's the criminals wielding the knives that are doing the killing. Does he really believe that banning rural hunters will stop knife crime in big cities? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Canadians deserve to feel safe, and Canadians must be able to feel safe in their communities. That's why, Mr. Speaker, on March 10th, I met with my provincial uh, counterparts, my territorial counterparts, to work on bail reform, to include repeat violent offenders, to include crimes with knives, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan. I invite the honourable member to read the joint communique that came out of that federal provincial uh, uh, territorial meeting of justice and public safety ministers, and we are moving ahead with that plan. Excellent. The honourable leader of the opposition. The question was for the prime minister, who didn't have the guts to get up and yeah, answer. Run, run away. A moment ago, I listed four murders and near murders that happened with knives in the last three days. This is part of a massive crime wave that the Prime Minister's catch and release bail system has unleashed right across the country. We did not have crime like this before he took office. His solution? Ban hunting rifles in rural communities. Mr. Speaker, I ask him again. Does he really believe that banning hunting rifles in rural communities will stop knife crime in downtown cities? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, we have been working with the provinces and territories with respect to bail reform since last October, Mr. Speaker. We appreciate that there is a concern out there amongst Canadians. There is a desire to be safe. There is a desire to feel safe. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we're... I'm, I'm going to interrupt the Honourable Minister. <laughs> the Honourable Minister, uh, please, from the top, because I, I missed the beginning. Go ahead. <laughs> I stopped it. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been working with provincial... Justice Ministers, Public Safety Ministers from the provinces and territories since last October, Mr. Speaker. We appreciate that Canadians need to feel safe and Canadians have a right to be safe, Mr. Speaker, which is why we have been working together on bail reform to address repeat offenders, to address violent crime, crime with knives, crime with guns, Mr. Speaker. We're moving ahead with that plan as we have, uh, as we have stated in the joint communique, but Mr. Speaker, this is a problem that will be solved working together. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, taxes have never been higher and the Liberals are awash with higher revenues from their inflationary deficits. Eight years of the Prime Minister and a price of the home has doubled. The price of rent has doubled. The price of an average mortgage payment has doubled. Credit card debt has never been higher and, rec and food, bank is at a re food bank use is at a record high. By all accounts, this isn't a record that anyone should aspire to. Their solution seems to be more deficits, more debt, more inflation. The Prime Minister has an opportunity at 4 p.m. today. Will he commit to no deficits and no new taxes? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, it's great to see our colleagues so excited about uh, the budget today. And in a short two hours, they will learn everything that is in the budget to support Canadians. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to make a prediction. No matter what measures are there to support Canadians through affordability challenges, no matter what's in there to grow an economy that helps everyone, no matter what's in there to position Canada for greatness in the future, the Conservative Party and the opposition in this House will, will vote, vote against, again. Mr. Speaker. It's what they've always done. It's what they will do again. They'll vote against. We'll keep delivering for Canadians. Member for Thornhill. 
government spent so much to achieve low, uh, to achieve so little, and he's right. We will vote against it. The member opposite should go to a food bank and tell someone. Okay, from the top, please. I should. The member opposite should go to a food bank and tell somebody that they've never had it so good. Perhaps she, he can tell a family struggling to pay their mortgage that they've never had it better. Or he can tell a small business owner that the struggle is a product of their own imagination. At a time where the government ha is awash with cash, Canadians are working harder and they are getting less. They believe that they can spend Canadians' money better than they can. Will he admit that his approach has failed? and commit today to no deficits and no new taxes. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, there are 2.7 million fewer Canadian in poverty today Absolutely. than when the Conservatives were in uh, government. That includes 450,000 children thanks to the Canada Child Benefit, which for a child under six could receive up to $7,000 a year. And let's talk about our child care agreements, Mr. Speaker, that have cut fees in half by 50 percent for families across this country, which could be up to an additional $6,000 mm -hmm. for ch families with children in registered care. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we are delivering for Canadians in hard times and we're going to continue to be there for them. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg saint charles Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance will announce today a decrease of $7 billion over five years to contracts to external consultants. But even more work could be done internally because the Prime Minister has caused an increase of 28% in the public service since 2017. The government is spending more than $21 billion a year on outsourcing and clearly intends to keep taking care of its friends. Will the Prime Minister commit to cutting outsourcing to reduce the burden on Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's great to see that our colleagues care so much about our budget today. They are so excited about it, and in two hours, they'll see. But I'm going to make a prediction. No matter what supports we offer Canadians in the budget, no matter what we do for the economy, no matter what is in the budget to green our economy, the Conservative opposition will vote against it. We are here for Canadians. They are against. We will deliver. The Honourable Member for charlebourg saint charles What does my colleague think of the fact that in 2019 the Prime Minister billed Canadians for a $200,000 personal vacation in Costa Rica and later another extremely expensive vacation in Jamaica last year? And he also violated federal conflict of interest law by accepting vacations and gifts and flights to a private island. Now, the Minister of Finance will announce cuts in the budget for government travel. Does that mean that Canadians will no longer have to fund the Prime Minister's sunny vacations? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, in just a couple of hours, the Minister of Finance will announce all the measures that will be in Budget 2023. And just after that, we will hear members across the way with their pre-written speech. But what we will not hear today from the opposition is a plan to fight climate change, to grow the economy. No plan to improve infrastructure. That's what we won't hear from them, but we have a plan. We will deliver for Canadians, and they will oppose that. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, the Trans Mountain Pipeline has now cost more than $30 billion. So yesterday, I asked the Minister of the Environment if he would formally recommend that his government put an end to this debacle. But he simply answered that he's not the Minister of Finance. But I was asking him, the Minister of the Environment, He's the one who read the IPCC synthesis report, and he's the one who's responsible for Canada's role in fighting climate change. Will he today formally recommend that his government finally put an end to the Trans Mountain fiasco? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague for her question. We have taken all necessary measures to stabilize the TMX project and to ensure that Canada gets fair market value for what is invested, and also to reach net zero by 2050. Mr. Speaker, let's look at the facts. We have created 12,700 jobs in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and BC. BMO and TD, among others, have confirmed that TMX will become commercially viable. We will ensure that Canadians get their fair share by finishing that project. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. 
Well, that will be quite tricky when it's already costing more than $30 billion. The IPCC chair in the synthesis report said that we have the know-how, the technology tools, financial resources, and everything that we could possibly need to overcome the climate problems that we have identified. What is lacking, however, is strong political will in order to end these problems once and for all. Mr. Speaker, that's the problem here. The political will to abandon Trans Mountain and other projects like Baie du Nord or offshore oil exploration and so on. Where is this political will that the IPCC is talking about? Where is it when it really counts? The Honorable Minister. Soyons clairs avec l'emphase que notre gouvernement a mis sur l'environnement, puisque 120 milliards de dollars investis dans l'environnement pendant notre administration, Monsieur le Président. Pendant, une fois que le projet TMX soit complété, on va commencer un, un processus pour qu'un consortium puisse acheter le, le, le bien. Et, Monsieur le Président, les Canadiens vont en retirer leur juste valeur. OK. L'honorable député de Avignon, la métier ce matin, Matapédia. Monsieur le Président, la seule volonté, c'est de produire plus de pétrole en espérant qu'il qu pollue moins. Mais c'est un échec. Pour la captation du carbone... Je vais prendre une petite pause. Je pense qu'il n'y a pas de traduction. Il n'y a pas de traduction. Apologies from the interpreter. We'll try again, this time with interpretation. I will be speaking French. I hope that interpretation is continuing. Yes, very good. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamitis Matan Matapetia. From the top, please. Mr. Speaker, the only thing this government wants seems to be to produce more oil and hope that it will pollute less, but that is not going to work. Ottawa has already spent $8.6 billion on oil companies for carbon capture, but these companies are complaining that it's not enough. The six biggest oil company fat cats have made $35 billion in profit, and yet they're still, get they're still getting $8.6 billion of public funds supposedly to pollute less, and they've only invested half a billion of that. And the worst thing is that these fat cats are asking for a second helping. Will this government finally cut them off? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for the question. And we're working on many fronts, uh, Mr. Speaker, to reduce uh, fossil fuel uh, emissions. We'll be capping uh, emissions from the oil and gas sector. We'll be investing, yes, in carbon capture and storage. We'll be implementing a clean fuel standard. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, very, very importantly, we'll be eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. We've eliminated eight. Uh, the rest will be eliminated uh, by the end of the year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Thanks to bad Liberal policy, last year was the most expensive harvest in Canadian history. $34 million in fertilizer tariffs, a carbon tax on feed, fuel, transportation, all led to record high production costs. The consequences of that fanned the flames of record high double digit food inflation. Does the Prime Minister not realize the consequences that increasing the carbon taxes had on food prices for Canadians? Will he commit? to cancel his carbon tax hike in today's budget. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, once again, we are working very hard with agricultural producers in Canada. I am very pleased to say that right now we are finalizing agreements on the Canadian Agreement for Sustainable Agriculture. This will allow our producers to produce more and better, reduce our carbon footprint, and be more productive. We are here to help them transition, and we will also be there to work together on productivity and competitiveness. For foothills. That's the problem, Mr. Speaker. Is agriculture isn't sustainable if they can't afford to farm. Right. The food price index was crystal clear. When the Liberals triple their carbon tax, it will cost the average farmer $150,000 a year. Yeah. The consequences of that are also crystal clear. Higher food costs, higher food production. A senior in my riding came to me in tears the other day, saying she can no longer afford groceries. She's having to make the choice between going to the food bank or keeping her home. Is that really what the Prime Minister wants? Is taxing Canadian farmers out of business and making Canadians choose between food and shelter? Will the Prime Minister give Canadians a break? Will he commit to cancel his carbon tax hike in today's budget? Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
once again. It's true that right now things are hard for Canadians and farmers who are facing a great deal of lack of predictability with the climate, for example, or the cost of inputs. But we will be here to help them in various ways. For example, the Canadian Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture. We have also improved the conditions of the advanced payment, payment program which will allow them to have access to loans up to $250,000, and we will be there to support our farmers. For Chilliwack Hope. According to the Canada's Food Price Report, food insecurity is about to get worse for Canadian families. It will now cost a family of four over $16,000 a year to pay for the food, an increase of over $1,000 from last year. Now is not the time to increase taxes on grocery bills. In today's budget, will the Prime Minister cancel his carbon tax and stop making it harder for Canadians to feed their families? The Honourable Minister of Families. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we understand that these are challenging times for Canadians, and it's why we have put important measures in place to help Absolutely. Canadians, like doubling the GST tax mm -hmm. credit that has helped almost 11 million Canadians across the country to deal with the high cost of everything, like the Canada Child Benefit that is indexed to inflation that increased last July because we recognized how important it is for families to take care of Absolutely. their basic needs. And Mr. Speaker, let's also talk about childcare, which is helping thousands and millions of Canadians across this country to help with the high cost of living. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Family of four now needs to come up with $16,000 a year to pay for basic food, and the Liberal carbon tax hike will make the cost to grow and transport that food even higher, which means record high grocery bills will be going up by over $1,000 this year. And while that might not be anything for a Prime Minister who would charge taxpayers $6,000 a night for a luxury hotel with a butler, for many Canadian families it could be the difference between eating and going hungry. So why doesn't he just do the right thing and cancel his carbon tax in today's budget? Here, here. General Minister of Immigration. We have been doing the right thing since we first formed government in 2015. When we formed government, the very first thing we did was raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could cut them for the middle class. Then we decided to stop sending childcare checks to millionaires so we could put more pocket money in the pockets of 9 out of 10 Canadian families. Through the pandemic, we were there for households because we believed households were too big to fail. Every step of the way, the Conservatives voted against us or held press conferences to say these big fat government programs would not get their support. Now they're campaigning on a commitment to take money away from families so they can make it free to pollute, that won't work in my neighbourhood. The Honourable Member for Port Moody Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, public transit is how Canadians get to work, how students get to school and how caregivers travel between communities. Yet since the pandemic, a financial crisis has meant cuts to public transit across the country. This hurts people and the climate. The Liberals have failed to be a reliable partner when it comes to funding this essential service. They must fix it now. Will the Minister of Finance secure permanent operational funding for public transit in today's budget? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our honourable colleague for her continued interest in supporting something as, as important as public transit. We agree with her this is important not only for protecting mm -hmm. our environment, but for prov providing a reliable and secure way for Canadians to get around communities, big and small, across the country. Our government has made record investments in yeah, public right. transit, including a permanent $3 billion public transit fund. We've always recognized the importance of this to Canadians, and Mr. Speaker will continue to support municipalities and provinces in securing public transit. Right Member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, for almost a decade I have asked respective governments to stop plans to bury and abandon nuclear waste near the Great Lakes. Last week, the U.S. Congress and Senate, both Democrat and Republican, united opposing Canada's plan to create this radioactive dump. High-level nuclear waste has long-lasting and devastating consequences on lakes that provide 40 million people with drinking water. The Liberals should be funding the organizations that clean and protect these waters, like the Lake Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, not science fiction. Will this government stop this plan from moving forward, instead focus on its commitments to keeping these lakes great? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Speaker. I want to assure everyone in this House and all Canadians that all radioactive waste in Canada is currently being safely managed according to international standards at facilities that are licensed and monitored by world-class regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. The CNSC is an independent regulator that makes science-based objective decisions and regularly undergoes peer reviews from world-renowned organizations. We are keeping Canadians safe, Mr. Speaker. Good the Honourable Member for Sudbury. Mr. Le Mr. Speaker, semiconductors are essential to operate our phones, computers and cars. This industry is vital to innovation and economic growth. Can the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry update the House on our recent success in investing in semiconductors and how these investments will help create good jobs for the future? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Sudbury for her excellent question. Yes, semiconductors are at the heart of the 21st century economy, and everyone in this House was happy last Friday when the President of the United States did talk about the cross-border corridor for the production of semiconductors. And we've also talked about investment, but more recently, yesterday, we announced here in Ottawa that a Canadian company will make the fastest and most efficient semiconductors. We are investing in the economy of the 21st century. Country. Speaker, Canadians are struggling with generational high inflation. Meanwhile, the Liberals are raking in the cash through tax increases on the backs of Canadians. After eight years of these Liberals, mortgages have doubled, rents have doubled, tax increases are creating uncertainty, and people are worried about losing their jobs. Labour groups, small businesses and everyday Canadians have demanded that the government cancel the excise tax increase. So will the Liberals listen to workers and businesses and cancel the April 1st excise tax increase in today's budget? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Here I thank my honourable colleague for her question and the work she does on behalf of the tourism sector in her area. Mr. Speaker, as Minister of Tourism, I understand the value that the spirits, beer and wine producers in our country offer not to their just their local communities, but to the visitor economy. And Mr. Speaker, we have removed the excise tax from low alcohol beer. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to keep the escalator in place. It's less than one cent per can of beer, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to see growth in the sector. Member for Kelowna, Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, this just shows how completely out of touch this government is with small businesses. I represent thousands of people in my community who work at wineries, breweries, cideries and distilleries. And I've seen how hard a business owner like Richard has worked planting his vineyard, going to school, building a small winery. And the struggles he's had, whether it's been bears eating his grapes or the government increasing his taxes. After 40-year high inflation, Richard cannot afford the Liberal plan for a 6% excise tax increase that will crush his bottom line. So will the Liberals listen to small business owners like Richard on a and on April 1st cancel the excise tax increase in today's budget? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, perhaps an apt question is will the Conservatives ever vote for a measure that we put on the table that reduces taxes? Because, Mr. Speaker, the record speaks for itself. Tax cuts for working Canadians, how did they vote three times? Against on home buyer taxes, reducing them. How do they vote? Against. A federal minimum wage, Mr. Speaker. What did the Conservatives do? They voted against. Eliminating interest on student loans. How did the opposition vote? Against. Mr. Speaker, whatever plans we put in place to reduce taxes, they vote against. We're here to deliver for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of Liberal governance, Canadians have never been taxed so high, and it's not over. Next Saturday, taxes will go up. Taxes on wine, beer and spirits, and the carbon tax will go up. It doesn't affect the Prime Minister personally, but when he goes to his riding in Montreal, he takes the most pollutive measure to get there, a flight, a 22-minute flight. He takes his private jet to go to Montreal. Can the Prime Minister act for the good of all Canadians and not increase taxes on April 1st? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives, when they were in power, there were 2.7 billion people more in poverty than there are today. When the Conservatives were in power, Mr. Speaker, Canadians received child benefit checks, but they had to pay tax on them. Under our governance, we increased the amount they received under the CCB for children, and that was tax-free. We're talking about $7,000 for children under seven years of age. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. But remember that the Prime Minister said that SMEs would allow them to pay less tax. But the, he has to look in the mirror. But the real small business owners know that when taxes go up, they can no longer give services that they provide. And there was a survey conducted recently that said 61 percent, rather 56 percent of businesses will have no choice but to raise prices. 45 percent will have to cut wages. But will the Prime Minister listen to SMEs and cut the carbon tax? Oh. The Honourable Minister, not only are we listening to SMEs, but we're showing them, we showed them during the pandemic that we're there for them. I meet many small businesses in my riding and across Quebec, and they've said that we were there for them. And it's thanks to the programs we established during the pandemic that they were able to keep their jobs. And therefore, families are now able to pay their rent and groceries. And, Mr. Speaker, we've always been there for SMEs and for people in the most greatest need. And that is what will be in today's budget. The, the Honourable Member for beauport Moilu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The costs for our dear Governor General of Canada during her official trip to Germany were close to $700,000. $700,000 for a four-day trip while Quebecers are tightening their belts. $700,000, even though we just increased her salary by $40,000 a year, almost as much as the median employment income of Quebecers. How many? $700,000 will ex expenses will it take to get the government to understand that this position is as costly as it is useless and it's time to abolish it? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If my colleague looked at the comparative figures, she'd realize this is the same as for other trips. We'll do everything to limit costs and to make sure things cost as little as possible. Thank you. Honorable. The Honourable Member for beauport Miwalu. Mr. Speaker, we don't have the same information, but I would like to say that all of my questions about the Governor General are about the office itself and not the person in office. It is the position itself that is the problem. It's expensive. Asking a person to literally think of herself as the Queen of Canada induces behaviour that is out of touch with reality. This is the repeated unjustifiable spending that is proof of this. Ms. Simon herself is wasting her talents in this useless and insulting position for all those for whom the British Crown has wronged over the years. When will it be abolished? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker. The bloc is attacking the function and the federation and Canada, things that are dear to everyone. And the bloc is here to promote separation, to create disputes as much as possible, and to make sure things don't work. But unfortunately for them, Mr. Speaker, Quebecers are very happy within Canada, and we would like to stay that way. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, this government spent $21.4 billion on outside wow. consultants in this fiscal year alone. That is a 95 per cent increase under this Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, this is at a time when Canadians are struggling to put food on a table. This is at a time when Canadians have record high credit card debt. So why doesn't this government show some compassion and stop helping high-priced consultants instead of struggling Canadians. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, it's important for the government to continue to deliver its ambitious agenda to help Canadians support workers and make sure 
that workers can offer their positions. So I think we have to continue to underline the importance of having an um, a bet Ambitious agenda. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that helps their friends. The trade minister gave $23,000 to her friend. The housing minister gave $93,000 to his friend. This government spent $21.4 billion on outside consultants. This is at a time when rents and mortgages are doubling. This is at a time when the excise tax and the carbon tax are set to increase on April 1st. So why doesn't this government find some compassion and help struggling Canadians instead of just their rich friends and consultants. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that it's important to be very careful how we characterize the use of consultant uh, services. When a government is, uh, in, for example, in a circumstance like a pandemic and it needs to scale up and expand its impact in a particular moment in time, it's important to be able to use contracting services so that we don't create permanent costs by engaging permanent employees. So the use of contracts allows flexibility in government to expand to deliver services without permanently increasing costs. Misrepresenting that and holding it out as something other than what it is, is irresponsible. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, at a time when Canadians are facing themselves being caught in the vice of a cost of living crisis, this Liberal government has done nothing but crank the handle. Rather than merely content themselves with raising the carbon tax, the tax on everything, this government is still spending millions upon millions of dollars on outside management consultants. Yeah. And I know I've been schooled on being careful about that, Mr. Speaker. There's something broken, Mr. Speaker, when these Liberals can't seem to understand that the spending is an inflationary dollar upon dollar. Why is the Prime Minister more focusing on helping his high-priced Liberal consultants than everyday Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, the use of consultants is a, a, an ability that allows government to maintain flexibility in uh, difficult times. As an example, in the pandemic, when we had to vastly increase our ability to be there for Canadians, to be there for small businesses, to make sure that they didn't fail, to make sure that they now could have the success that we're seeing in the incredible jobs recovery that we've seen that's one of the strongest anywhere of our comparator nations. It is, in fact, the ability to use the flexibility of contracts to achieve that, to miscarry characterize that or to try to, to create shadows with it is irresponsible. Right here. Honourable Member for Yukon. Mr. Speaker, as a joint Canada-US command, NORAD is integral to maintaining peace, stability and sovereignty in our country. Given Russia's arbitrary and brutal invasion of Ukraine and other recent threats to global security, there is intense interest in my constituency of the Yukon and across the North in our government's commitment to modernizing NORAD while respecting and protecting Arctic sovereignty. Could the Minister of National Defence update the House on the progress made to protect Canada's Arctic security? The Honourable Minister for National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Last week, we reaffirmed our commitment to continental defence and Arctic security by investing $7.3 billion in bases across this country, including in bases that will house the F-35. These investments will ensure economic benefits for Indigenous communities and Canadians across this country, Mr. Speaker. And as President Biden said, we can rest soundly knowing that NORAD has the watch. Thank you. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. This past Sunday, 37-year-old Paul Stanley Schmidt was fatally stabbed, not shot, outside a downtown Vancouver Starbucks. His wife, three-year-old daughter, and dozens of others witnessed this horrific, almost casual attack. After eight years of this Prime Minister's soft on crime policies, Canadians face a national crime wave. Government should alleviate suffering, not increase it. When will this Prime Minister give jail, not bail, to violent criminals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our thoughts go out to the family 
of the individual the member mentioned and to any individuals who are the victims of violent crime. Our government is taking needed action to deal with violent crime, including gun control, but most importantly, taking a multi-pronged approach to it, Mr. Speaker, dealing with mental health, investing in mental health, investing in communities through the Building Safer Communities Fund, because we know that we need to address the root causes of crime in order to keep Canadians safe. Great. Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, let's talk facts. The brutal and horrific stabbing last Sunday marks Vancouver's six homicide in 2023, where 40 offenders were arrested for 6,000 crimes in one year. Canadians are afraid to walk city streets and take transit. Violent crime is up 32 percent. Gang murders are up 92 percent under this Prime Minister's watch. Ask the family of 16-year-old Gabriel Magalies killed, stabbed, not shot, waiting for transit in Toronto. Will the Prime Minister get serious, put innocent victims first, and replace bail with... The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And any kind of spike in violence like the one on the TTC is concerning to all of us. That's why we work with municipalities like the City of Toronto, like the City of Vancouver, to invest in the root causes of crime. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we're making investments in mental health, because we know that Mr. Speaker, we know that we need to be investing in the root causes, but we cannot ignore the impact that guns have on crime, and that's why we will proudly take action, as we are in Bill C-21. The Honourable Member for Belshaft, Lady Chemin Levy. Mr. Speaker, in the eight last years that this Prime Minister has been in office, violent crime has risen by 32 per cent. Our streets are less and less safe, and this government, with its laxist sentencing policies, is making the problem worse. Mr. Speaker, everyone fears for their safety. When will this Prime Minister and his government take this problem of violence seriously? The Honourable Minister of Justice, Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve to feel safe and to be safe in their communities. Mr. Speaker, since last October, we have been working with our counterparts in the provinces and territories to look at bail for serious offences and repeat offenders, including stabbings, amongst others. Mr. Speaker, we admitted a joint Communique, and we are going to move forward with this. For Vancouver, Grenville. Monsieur le Président, notre... Mr. Speaker, our government will always be on the side of Canadian workers and families. Measures such as $10 a day child care, rent support and children's dental care are just a few of the measures that we have proposed that are making a real difference in the lives of Canadian families. On April 1st, the federal minimum wage will increase to 16.55 per hour, an increase that will benefit thousands of federally regulated private sector workers. Can the Minister of Labour tell us what this change means for Canadians and what other measures we are putting in place to support workers? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question on April 1st. The federal minimum wage will increase for federally regulated private sector workers. But that's not all. We've established a labor mobility tax credit for workers and paid sick leave under federal for workers under federal legislation. We've invested in union-led training programs and we're putting more funding uh, for workers across the country. Member for London, Fanshawe. For 
decade, senior officials refused to acknowledge the sexual misconduct crisis in the military. While survivors finally received an apology, that culture of secrecy remains. Just this month, the media reported the existence of documents on mis sexual misconduct that the Department of Defense previously denied. The government says they're working to address this crisis, but they're not making the necessary changes for transparency. Will this minister finally take responsibility and establish that independent civilian oversight of our military to protect the women and men who serve? Minister for National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from my honourable colleague. Let me reiterate that since I've been appointed, we have put on the table a number of additional reforms, including laying a roadmap for all 48 of the recommendations of Madame Arbour, Mr. Speaker. In addition to an official apology, in addition to millions of dollars in supports for victims and survivors, as well as the transfer of cases from the military justice system to the civil justice system. Mr. Speaker, we will always support victims of sexual misconduct and sexual harassment. Here, Thank here. you. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, many of my constituents who are refugees and former refugees are facing major delays obtaining travel documents even when they provide proof of urgency. Between 2020 and 2021, only 15 percent of applications were processed within 20 business days by the IRCC. Many have been waiting for over a year. The member for Vancouver East and I have written to the minister twice about this issue. When will the minister take action to ensure that refugees and former refugees can access their right to travel? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, Canada has a proud tradition of resettling some of the world's most vulnerable people. Of course, we, through the pandemic, resettled more uh, refugees than any other country in the world. And we know that when people come here, having the desire to travel, to see loved ones in other parts of the world, is a priority for them. Over the course of the past year and a half, we've made significant investments to add staff to our department. We've adopted new technologies and relaxed administrative burdens to speed up processing times so people can be more quickly reunited with their loved ones. I'd be pleased to continue my work to expedite processing times, including for refugee travel documents, so more people can connect with those they care about most more quickly. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. C'est tout le temps que nous avons. That's all the time we have today. Attention of members to the presence in the gallery of Ms. Margareta Zetterfeld, President of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe Parliamentary Assembly. I believe uh, we have a point of order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton with Taskowin. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, if you'll indulge me for a few seconds, before I get to my specific motion, I'd like to recognize the tireless work of Senators Leo Hosakos and Peter Beam and former Senator Jim Munson in support of autistic Canadians and their families. And the member from Don Valley East and members from all parties in this House who helped us get to this point. And most importantly, my son Jaden, who inspires me every single day. Yeah.